Good afternoon, colleagues. I'm going to start. Welcome to this session, our um, special session, the FP uh, uh, Retief Lecture. Uh, as I said this morning, I'm looking forward uh, to Professor Fillet's uh, speech this afternoon, um, bringing us the FP Retief Lecture on our 50th uh, celebrations. A bit about uh, Professor Pillay, you can read everything in the, in the program, um, but just to say, Prof. Pillay um, graduated in 1980 cum laude at the University of Natal. He obtained a PhD in biochemistry uh, from the University of Cambridge and completed his postgraduate specialist training in Hammersmith Hospital, Imperial College London and also postdoctorate um, training in molecular cell biology and endocrinology at the University of California, San Diego. He's a fellow of the Royal College of Pathologists and the College of uh, Pathologists of South Africa. Prof. Uh, Tahir is a, a chief specialist, a chemical pathologist. He was, uh, he's at the present moment professor and head of the Department of Chemical Pathology at the University of Pretoria. Um, and also uh, linked with the National Health Laboratory Services, or the NHLS, Steve Biko Academic Hospital, and Director of the Division of Clinical Pathology and Clinical um, Pathology Training Program, and also Honorary uh, Professor of uh, Chemical Pathology at the University of Cape Town. He was uh, also previously Head of Chemical Pathology at the University of Cape Town and a Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Deputy Director, Institute of uh, Cell Signaling, uh, University of Nottingham, UK. He's the President of the South African Association of Clinical Biochemistry and Laboratory Medicine. He's just been appointed by the Executive Board of the International Federation of Clinical Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine. So also congratulations to hear about that position, which is a, is a, a really international position to, to take on. And to it, um, one of three divisions, Communication and uh, Publication Division of the IFCC from January 2019. He's also the first person um, in, from the African continent to head a division of the IFCC since the, its inception in uh, 1952. He's one of the only two full professors of chemical pathology in South Africa and also um, NRF rated uh, scientists with uh, NRF. In South Africa it has been spearheaded the uh, application of state of the art digital technology in textbook uh, publishing uh, with the release of two um, acclaimed four dimensional digital textbooks in laboratory medicine. He's also co uh, editor. Um, in chief of the London based uh, BMJ Group Journal, Journal of Clinical Pathology. He serves on several prestigious international committees, the Communication and Publication Division, uh, Executive Committees of the International Federation of Clinical uh, Chemistry and Laboratory Medicine, the International Committee of Royal College of Pathologists, London, and as uh, country advisor to the Royal College. Um, um, of pathologists. Um, I can um, definitely tell you that Prof. Pillay has been um, recognized on an international level with numerous awards. He's also um, done research in molecular uh, um, biology of insulin signaling and you can read about that. Uh, I'm not sure if he's going to tell us something about that this afternoon. Okay. Um, and uh, I think uh, colleagues are uh, privileged to have Prof. Tahir Pillay uh, this afternoon to present the FP uh, Retief uh, Lecture. Tahir, welcome and thank you. Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Professor Manzeo, for that uh, very long introduction. Um, uh, well, Dumelang, uh, Kuyamela, good afternoon. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and a happy 50th uh, to you. And it's, it's, it's a privilege and an honor to be here on this, on this 50th occasion, especially, but also um, because uh, I looked at the list of 
the uh, previous speakers, and um, it, it was quite an illustrious list, and, and um, including um, my dear friend and late colleague, uh, Professor Bongani Mayosi. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm going to, and, and it's also a, a, another privilege for me, as because I'm, I'm here in a different row. The only times I've been here uh, to this institution has been part of an accreditation panel. <laughs> so it's, it's, uh, it's nice to come back in a different role and actually to talk about um, uh, things that I'm, I'm interested in. So I'm going to um, uh, give a combination, talk about a combination of things, uh, basically some history, um, some interesting um, new developments in, in science and medicine, um, and also blend some of my own uh, research interests into that. And I hope you will you will find it interesting. So, uh, in brief, um, I'm going to just discuss a brief history of, of, of immunoassays, um, and then talk about antibody structure and, 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 and antibodies that come from camels, um, and then talk about nanobodies, and I'll, I'll explain what nanobodies are when I, when I get to that, um, and then what their advantages are, certainly for for both the diagnosis and, and, and therapy. Um, and then um, I'll give you an example of how this can be applied to diagnostic, certainly in the case of, uh, in, of tuberculosis. And then touch on what I, when I said that the title of the talk was about next generation technologies and really uh, gene editing is, is really one of the new, new generation of technologies that's finding increasing use both in um, uh, diagnostic uh, laboratory medicine and in, me in medicine in general. So, <clears throat> as a personal story, <clears throat> how many of you recognize these structures? So, uh, someone there. You rec well, what is it? Which, which college? Okay, it's, it's St. John's College. So, the, the story begins because I'm, I was, um, as a fourth year medical student, um, I became, I, was in, I became interested in chemical pathology as a fourth year medical student, and I decided that's what I wanted to do. And part of the, uh, and that occurred because I had very inspirational teachers, and that's something very important uh, in, in medical schools, to have inspirational teachers. I decided I wanted to do chemical pathology, uh, but I also wanted to do science and do research. And so I was fortunate enough that I won a scholarship immediately after medical school, I won a scholarship to Cambridge. Uh, to do a PhD, and, and St. John's College was my, my college. And that's actually the, the Bridge of Sighs uh, in St. John's College. There's another one in, um, in Venice that you may also have heard of, and, and this is what the students do in, in their free time. They go punt along the river camp. So, um, so there were two aspects to that. I was interested in science, and I wanted to do a PhD, and, and that sort of influenced my... Um, my outlook uh, from then on, because I've um, certainly in pathology and chemical pathology, um, uh, much to the to the chagrin and, uh, and 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 it's caused a lot of acrimony amongst my colleagues because I've always wanted to promote a strong science agenda, and I think that's something that seems to be uh, certainly lacking um, in 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 a lot of our disciplines nowadays. Anyway, so at that point in time. Um, so this is the Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, and I had um, wanted to work there. Now, the interesting thing about this institution, um, it was on the Addenbrooke's Hospital site in Cambridge. So um, I worked in Addenbrooke's Hospital, and this laboratory was just across the road. Now, the most interesting thing about this institution is it's produced 11 Nobel laureates, which is, is a phenomenal record, and, and one of the ones... Uh, and a couple of important things, that there, were two, um, there were two South Africans who were amongst those um, 11 Nobel Prize winners, uh, Sidney Brenner and Aaron Klug, and both of whom were actually med former medical students, so they were doctors, um, and they had gone to work there. And I was interested, actually, I inquired with, with Cesar Milstein, and I'll talk about Cesar Milstein, who developed the monoclonal ant antibody technology, and he got the Nobel Prize. So um, I had wanted to go there, but then um, I, I thought about um, 
going to a, a, a chemical pathology department because I wanted to, to get that kind of um, a background uh, to the PhD. So in, in effect, so this here is, this was the old LMB building and this is their brand new building. I don't know how many billions of pounds it must have cost, uh, but it's, it, it's certainly a, it's, it's the newer, the, the, the current building. And so um, I ended up in, in the laboratory of Nick Hales. <coughs> which was across the road. And so Nick Hales is um, uh, right, in, and right by that time, in 1975, the, the monoclonal te antibody technology had just been, had been developed. And I, was, I, was in I started in Cambridge in 1986. Uh, Nick Hales um, was interested in, in, in developing assays to, to measure hormones, particularly insulin. So he pioneered the uh, so-called IRMA assay the immunoradiometric assay. Now, the whole, uh, the whole field of radio immunoassays really starts off with uh, these two people uh, that you may have heard of, Rosalind Yellow and, and, and Solomon Burson. So they developed um, the competitive immunoassay for insulin. And for that, um, Rosalind um, Yellow received the, the Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, um, Solomon Burson had died uh, by the time that the prize was awarded, so they don't award prize, Nobel Prizes to people who are, are no longer living. Now, there's another, so they had used, um, in, in those assays, they'd used antibodies from, from patients, uh, type 1 diabetic patients who had antibodies to insulin. So they, 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 they managed to get some, purify some of those antibodies and use, use them in the, in the competitive assay. Um, now, w um, to my mind, one of the tragedies, and it happens often in science, is that uh, this man here, Roger Eakins, he should have also have, he developed an assay for thyroid hormone, uh, not using an antibody, but using thyroglobulin as the binding protein. And he did it at the same time as Yellow and Bursa, but unfortunately it was never acknowledged. And he actually should have received the Nobel Prize as well, because this was a major uh, development at that time. And that's unfortunately... Um, <clears throat> As you will see in history and science, it happens. It happens quite often. So um, the so the so uh, Nick Hales had developed the insulin assay using polyclonal antibodies, and then um, later on, when Milstein across the road had developed the antibody technology in '75, uh, they then uh, the, the the department then went on to, to use monoclonal antibodies. And actually, it was interesting because it was one of the, the few labs that I knew that I know of was was extremely good at producing um, monoclonal antibodies in in mice. So, just as an aside, <clears throat> the first time uh, Rosalind Yellow submitted this paper, the, the paper that for which they were awarded the Nobel Prize, the first time it was rejected. And um, so that tells you something about uh, not giving up uh, as well. And then she. Um, uh, and, and this is the rejection letter, and, and one of the things they asked her to do was to change the title of the, of, the, um, of the paper, and the paper got accepted. Now, one of the things I've learned now is one of the most important things on, a, on a, getting a paper accepted is the title. Because if the title is not interesting enough, uh, uh, the editors immediately close their minds to it. And I certainly experienced it with um, one of my registrar's papers. We... Um, the paper went uh, to one journal, uh, got rejected, and then all we did was we changed the title and sent it back to another journal and it got accepted. So it, it just tells you about uh, what happens to, the, um, um, to papers when you change the title. So, so coming back to this, so the whole, uh, and the various other um, types of assays were developed, and then in in about 1994, uh, there was another discovery uh, of, uh, uh, of antibodies uh, which centered around the camelid family. So <clears throat> why are antibodies important? So uh, if, you, if you think that um, more than 70% of clinical decision making depends on the laboratory and you need an analysis from the laboratory, and a lot of that analysis needs immunoassays. So you need antibodies, and you need good antibodies. Um, and not only that, 
in histopathology nowadays, immunohistochemistry, all the different types of cancers and tumors that are di diagnosed need high quality, good antibodies. Uh, therapeutic applications as well. <clears throat> now, obviously these are only useful for protein antigens because you need uh, a, 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 a compound that can generate an immune response to, to get an antibody. And they usually bind with high affinity and they can be polyclonal or monoclonal. And monoclonal meaning uh, that they come from one single uh, B cell clone. And the big advantage and, the, and the, reason, the reason for the revolution in monoclonals was that you ended up with an infinite supply. Now, we still have a lot of polyclonal um, antibodies on, uh, that are in the market and are used in diagnosis. But <clears throat> as often happens in labs, the characteristics of the assay changes because now the antibody comes from a rabbit or a sheep or a goat. Now, and that animal doesn't live forever. So at some point, that supply is going to go, and you have to use another animal, which has got a slightly different immune response, and then the, 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 the nature of the assay changes, and that's, and that's a problem with polyclonals. And as I said, monoclonals, they became big because <coughs> you could produce them uh, forever. And they could be used to then identify, antibodies could be used to find new uh, biomarker proteins or analytes. And as I mentioned, the diagnostic reagents, the bio, we're seeing now there's, there's a lot of uh, monoclonal antibodies being used for therapy. Um, not, not available in South Africa, but in, in, certainly in the U.S. A lot of diseases, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, um, some of the lung cancers are, are being treated with monoclonal antibodies. And, and they ha are having extremely good results. But unfortunately, the technology is still very expensive and, and certainly not yet affordable in, in, in countries like ours. So the, the problem with um, the traditional um, antibody, uh, which may come from a, a monoclonal antibody, which comes from a mouse, uh, is, is the size. You can have good affinity and stability and high expression of those antibodies, and you can get uh, good titers. But the problem comes about is that they're not very stable, uh, either with temperature, or, or pH, and if you have a very small binding pocket, uh, the antibody will not recognize it because it's a large molecule. So uh, and the other problem as well with the, with, the, with the therapeutic antibodies is that they need to be humanized because if, if, the, if you inject a mouse protein into a human, you're going to get an immune response. So those have to be uh, re-engineered um, to humanize them, and then re-engineering those is, is not very easy. Um, so, next question. What do these have in common? What do these animals have in common? So you've got three species of mammals, and then you've got a little a fish. Interestingly, so these, um, these are the members of the camel family, <coughs> uh, which includes the alpacas, uh, the camels, and the llamas. <coughs> And then this creature here, the shark, has a very interesting uh, uh, biological feature that is common with these animals. And so, um, uh, so these are all these are all part of the camel family, the llamas and the, the alpacas, which are the size of a of a, of a, a dog. All belong to this, the camelidae family, and they've all, all evolved with a very similar. Um, biology, <clears throat> and what's interesting about them is that they, their antibody is a, is a small antibody. It's a single chain antibody. <clears throat> now this was discovered by a graduate student um, in Belgium. So basically, um, he ran. So this is an SDS gel uh, to analyze proteins. So he ran the gel one day, and he and he found that he didn't see that. You couldn't see the conventional, um, the the normal antibody would normally, if you run it on a on a reduced gel, in other words, in the in the presence of a reducing agent, you get a large, a high molecular weight band and a low molecular weight band, and he found a very small band. And um, his PhD supervisor thought he had made a mistake, and asked him to do it again, and he got the same result. And then the supervisor, as will often happen. Supervisor stepped in and decided to do himself, and he found the same result. 
and this was from camel blood. Now, I don't know why they were working with camel blood and what was interesting about the camel at that point in time, but anyway, um, they found that it produced a, a unique antibody. That was in 1994, and this really set off the whole, uh, the whole field. And the, the advantage of these, so, so these antibodies are much smaller, <laughs> so they're more stable uh, to high temp at high temperatures and extremes of pH. And because they're small, see, compared to the, to the conventional antibody, much smaller, so they, they have the antibody binding domain in a very small fragment. And they can get into small pockets in proteins uh, much easier than a, a large um, mammalian, 150 kilodalton mammalian antibody can. And so that's the, one of the real big advantages of these. So you, can, you have the antigen binding domain in, in, a, in a small fragment and in a single fragment. Now, this, the stability of the pH and also it can cross uh, membranes. Um, you're less likely to get uh, immune reactions to them and you can convert them into different formats and make fusions with other, uh, other proteins. There's also the potential for oral delivery and uh, using diagnostic devices. And the other advantage is that they can, if you attach them to um, a tag, um, uh, a cytotoxic tag, and use it for chemotherapy, it, it'll be filtered at, at the glomerulus. And then for crystal structures, they can be used as, as chaperones to, to uh, crystallize proteins. Uh, they can also be used as intra, intra bodies because they, they enter the cells. Because of their small size, you can get into, into cells. Now, that's the one property, that the, the, the stability to temperature and pH means that if you package the, this into a, into a reagent kit, you can ship it across Africa without any refrigeration. So if you incorporate this in the diagnostic kit, and that's a big advantage, the stability is fantastic. The other thing is that the size <laughs> means that you can do all kinds of things with it. Uh, both in terms of expression or even changing the structure of the antibody because a small protein means a small gene. Small gene means you can manipulate it easily by PCR in, in, a, in, a, in a laboratory and you could even, you can easily do that in, uh, uh, in any laboratory here, in any, any biochemistry lab or, or molecular biology lab, for example, in this university. So the, we said that the mammalian antibody is this large antibody with both heavy and light chains, and so that's a classical antibody, and that's a classical immunology that we've, we've all learned, but these animals evolved a, dis a different biology and evolved a heavy chain only antibody, and in that heavy chain only antibody, you can actually take this, um, you see with the mammalian antibody, you need both chains to create this, this uh, antigen binding site here. But with this one, the antigen binding site is contained in this, in this very small 15 kilodalton fragment. So the 15 kilodalton size means that you can make it in the lab. Once you've got the gene for this, you can make it in the lab and you can make it in the test tube. You can make it in bacteria. And so you don't need any fancy um, uh, system to, um, to express it. And if we look at some of the properties, um, so these are nanobodies. Now the term nanobodies is, is, is based on the, on the fact that they are only nanometers in size. Um, and, and, and this is the, the, the VHH part of the, of the camel heavy chain antibody. Um, in terms of uh, the properties that they have that are unique, the, the antigen binding is much more efficient than, say, you can take the mammalian antibody, you can chop it into a, a what is called the fab fragment, so the fragment antigen binding, and then you can also express parts of it as a single chain uh, F, FB fragment. But you generally get more stability, and, and the big advantage is stability, solubility, and expression, uh, which makes it much easier to work with than um, conventional monoclonal antibodies. And certainly for, in terms of blood retention and antibody size, if you compare the nanobody to the conventional mammalian antibody, uh, the mammalian antibody, if, it would tr if, if it's in, injected into a patient, uh, it will stay in the blood for several weeks. And this sometimes actually causes problems. Um, it is causing problems nowadays because of uh, in for serum protein electrophoresis. So these often appear as 
uh, <coughs> paraprotein bands. So, so for those of you who are used to diagnosing uh, myelomas and, and um, uh, paraproteinemias, sometimes these therapeutic antibodies can appear as a band on, on the serum, and they, they can be misdiagnosed as, as, uh, as a myeloma. So, <coughs> so this was the technology that was originally devised uh, by uh, Cesar Milstein and, and George's caller for which they got the Nobel Prize. So, that, so the conventional monoclonal antibody usually comes from a mouse. <clears throat> so the mouse in, is injected with the antigen and then it generates an immune response and then the spleen is taken out from the mouse and, and then those cells are fused with a, a, another cell line, a myeloma cell line. And, and so there's a complementation of an essential enzyme uh, from these cells into those cells uh, these cells are now carrying some of the genes against the antigen. And then those, those cells fuse, and they allow these <coughs> myeloma cells to grow, and then they generate clones. So you get another, uh, basically you get tumor cells growing, and, and from those tumor cells you can identify the single antibody that's producing the antibody against your antigen. Um, now, <coughs> and once the, so the antibody gets secreted into into the culture medium, just like the B cell does in, in, in vivo, when the B cell secretes the antibody into the blood. And then you can um, <clears throat> generate the antibody by, uh, this diagram shows something that's actually now, it's banned in the, in, certainly banned in the UK because of animal rights, uh, because what they do, they take the um, myeloma cells and, and inject them into the peritoneum of the mouse and create ascites, and ascites has the as the antibody that you want. Um, and so nowadays, people grow that in, do that in, tend to do that in culture, large scale cultures. Now, the route to producing an antibody in a camelid is much easier. Uh, certainly not, not as complex as the monoclonal antibodies because you can imagine you'd need uh, expensive cell culture facilities to, to do the monoclonal antibody work. The, basically, with, um, with the camelid family, you basically, um, inject the antigen, um, you get an immune response, and from that, <clears throat> after you've done a second booster and waited the, for the required amount of time, the animal is bled and then uh, the white cells are isolated from the blood. So the white cells have all the antibody producing genes. And from that, um, from those white blood cells, the cDNA is isolated and um, RNA is produced, um, and then that's then um, packaged into a, a phage display library. So the antibody library is then has all the clones of antibodies that you're looking for, and then from those you have to fish out uh, the right um, antibody that binds to your antigen. And once you've got a single uh, a single um, uh, antibody gene. It can then be expressed and, and purified. Um, now, the, the step just, just shows the steps of producing the, the, the antigen or the nanobody or the VHH against a particular antigen. So the, the RNA, you, you basically isolate um, uh, RNA, put it back into E. coli, produce these phages, and then select the phage that you want uh, by repeated cycles. So it's, this is something, in terms of complexity, much easier to do in a, in a, in a, in a, in a small-scale um, laboratory. And then b that's basically, you'll end up with um, uh, this fragment here, which is now, you've got the gene for the fragment, and so having the gene for, for the fragment means you can express it in bacteria uh, quite easily. So um, these are our alpacas, Ronaldo and Messi, as we call them. Um, which uh, we, we've, we've started doing this on, on, a, on a small scale. And I think um, the alpacas, uh, alpacas are not indigenous to South Africa, but there are lots of farmers that have them. And the reason that they have them is because of wool, for wool production. So we get, um, we get the, uh, so some, not all of the alpacas produce good wool. So some, uh, some of the alpacas are sort of, uh, reject, uh, reject animals. They don't produce uh, good wool, so the farmers don't know what to do with them. So those are the ones we use. Um, 
And also to remember, in terms of animal welfare, the animal doesn't have to be killed or sacrificed or anything. You just take blood from it and, and get the white blood cells from it. So we we don't work on tuberculosis, but you know, from a from a laboratory diagnostic point of view, we're interested in developing new assays and new reagents. And so um, one of the things we we got interested in is is the whole problem of TB diagnosis, because uh, TB diagnosis depends on on um, on culture, depends on PCR with a gene expert, but often. In a lot of cases, if you take TB pericarditis or TB effusion, uh, uh, it's often difficult to make the diagnosis unless you have an assay that can detect an antigen. And so one of the proteins we thought um, would be interesting is the, this protein called the resuscitation promoting factor. Now, TB is a, is a disease that lies dormant. And so, in fact, um, uh, some of you may be infected with TB, and, but because you're healthy, Nothing will ever happen to you, and only in the case where, where your immune system gets suppressed and the TB flares up, and, and this is the protein that's supposed to do it, the resuscitation promoting factor, so it wakes the bacterium up. And so we, we, we wanted to use this because this is one of the proteins that's maybe secreted into the, in a TB infection, secreted in the fluid, and so we can develop an assay for it, make an antibody, develop an assay. We can detect it, but even more, there's a potential that you can um, use this as therapy because if you can, if your antibody is able to inhibit this protein, it has a potential of of, of switching off this of this factor. So basically, um, it's a key uh, factor in, in rescuing dormant uh, microbacterium, um, and it's been found that antibodies suppress the growth of the organism in vivo, and if you add it to cultures of old cells. Uh, you can get the mycobacteria to be stimulated, and and again, if you if you, if you if you delete the gene of this RPF, um, uh, you can the the resuscitation is 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 affected. So it's it's one of the one of the important proteins we think that could be used both for for diagnosis and therapy with a good uh, a single chain uh, nanobody, and obviously this can be then be incorporated into an assay kit. So um, nowadays, the the point of care market is is developing to, um, and a lot of it is using antibody technology to incorporate antibodies into these strips. So much like the pregnancy test, the pregnancy test is a good example of that, of of a lateral flow immunoassay. So you can incorporate these in into into lateral flow strips. And then use them as a dipstick to to make a a, a diagnosis. So I think uh, these will become increasingly available over the next 20 to 30 years. So, so I'm going to change tracks now. As I said, we we talked about immunoassays, antibodies, nanobodies, um, and then RP um, resuscitation promoting factor B. Now, to come on to the uh, uh, next generation technology uh, gene editing approaches. So, uh, the gene editing technology, uh, which is which is probably one of the uh, biggest breakthroughs in recent times, in, certainly in medicine and science. And um, uh, what is interesting is that um, so we um, we've been working on uh, trying to identify how antiretroviral drugs uh, affect uh, or cause insulin resistance. And one of the things uh, we found is that salicylate aspirin, uh, which acts through the, the, the nuclear factor kappa B pathway, uh, inhibits the, the ability of certainly protease inhibitors to cause uh, insulin resistance. Now, that kind of an uh, experiment is a very crude experiment because it's, 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 it's basically using pharmacology. And to really take it further, um, we need to do... Um, a genetic experiment. So, in other words, either remove the gene for nuclear factor kappa B or um, uh, or overexpress it, for example. Now, the nuclear factor kappa uh, B, which is uh, its full name, is the nuclear factor kappa light chain enhancer of activate, activated B, B cells. Uh, it, it controls. Uh, it's a transcription complex. Controls transcription of DNA, uh, and 
It's found in all, almost all cell types, and it, it's really the pathway that responds to stress, cytokines, free radicals, uh, UV radiation, and bacterial or viral antigens. So you, you get a signal going through the receptor, and eventually these two, this heterodimer um, of nuclear factor kappa B, which is one of them is REL A and P50, uh, they then that they then translocate when the pathway is activated and bind to DNA and, and, and activate transcription, and that regulates a lot of the inflammatory uh, uh, responses. So, in general terms, if you um, if you're trying to look at use a, a, um, a cell biology approach to look at signaling, you can do a number of things. Um, you can try overexpressing the protein, which is a bit messy. You can try to knock out the gene. Now, the conventional technology for knocking out genes was based uses the knockout mouse. But that's a very expensive way, and it's a very cumbersome, and it can't be done in, all, in, 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 in any, anywhere or in any institution. And, and it certainly requires a lot of expertise. And then you would get the cell line from it. You can use small interfering RNAs to affect expression, or you can use antisense um, oligonucleotides. So, um, I was, um, after traveling uh, to a few meetings um, in the U.S. and speaking to people, um, and, and actually going to a talk by one of the uh, discoverers of this, it became clear that uh, this was actually quite a, a robust and very easy technology to use. And that's, this is why it's become so big, because it's, it's, it's so um, uh, easy to do. And so we wanted, to, and, and the way this works, so the whole CRISPR method is, is based on uh, a, a fact that it's a bacterial um, immune response, it's an adaptive immune response. So just like in mammals, so in, when a bacterium gets invaded by a virus, the bacteriophage, the bacteriophage will inject its DNA into the bacterium. So in the same way a mammal, uh, a mammalian cell gets uh, exposed to a protein, it develops an immune response, and then when it it's re-exposed to the protein, it has immunological memory. So this is the bacterial uh, immunological memory. So the bacteria, uh, the, the bacteria will, will take some of that viral DNA and incorporate it into its genome. And then by incorporating that in the, into its genome, it can make this RNA for that DNA. And then this large protein here called Cas9 uh, will bind, um, uh, will take that piece of uh, uh, DNA, uh, RNA at least, and then which is called a guide RNA, and when the, the same bacterial virus comes back, it will recognize this um, uh, uh, virus again. So it's a, it's a form of um, it's an adaptive immune response uh, uh, in bacteria. So uh, in the same way that um, a, a, a mammalian cell can recognize an antigen when it's been exposed to it for the first time. So so just to give you a summary of that, the, <clears throat> you've got a, um, a, a viral DNA and the bacterium gets incorporated into the bacterial genome. So when the bacterium sees this uh, DNA again, it will recognize it. And this, this Cas protein, which is a nuclease, will then destroy the DNA. Now you can then take that, and the CRISPR stands for Clustered Regularly Interspersed Short Palindromic Repeats, um, uh, which is basically referred to refers to the uh, to the to the DNA sequence the the palindromic repeats that are incorporated with this um, this memory DNA that comes from the virus now uh, this was discovered in bacteria but then it, it, it was discovered that it's widely applicable to mammalian cells so you can use the system to uh, program and, and to perform gene editing in mammalian cells you can take a you can look you can take a genome, find a sequence that you're interested in, make an RNA sequence, and and then put it back into the cell, and and the Cas9 will just cut out that particular gene, and so the gene is gone, and this is why this has become uh, so popular uh, um, uh, for for not just for um, uh, the kind of things that I'm talking about, but you know people have uh, ideas of other types of application, so. So once the, once the DNA is cut off, it gets repaired, and you can use it now to create knockouts because one part of the gene will be deleted. And so that gene will not be um, uh, expressed. 
or you can do other things with it. You can put other genes into that gap as well if you want to by HR homologous uh, recombination. So we uh, started to use this, and basically we, we wanted to use this for the NF-kappa B. So, so the, the, this is the workflow of how this works. So you, you basically make an oligonucleotide sequence. In other words, you just order it from a company. You put it into this uh, expression vector, and you just put it into the cell, and it, it goes into the cell, and then it recognizes this, the sequence here is called the guide RNA. So the guide RNA is specific for a gene. It goes into the cell. The Cas9 then goes to the gene and basically clips out that part of the DNA. So we've been able to use this to, to basically knock out this um, um, uh, the NF-kappa B65 gene. So this is the um, in the wild type, and this is in the knockout. So this is just a Western blot showing that we don't have any protein expression. Now, this is so robust and so easy to, to do that we, it, it, and it provided us with a very easy way to actually do uh, the kinds of things that we want to do uh, without too much effort and too much, actually too much expertise required and, and, and expensive facilities. So we hope to use that to actually now try to dissect out uh, this pathway and to see whether, for example, uh, the antiretroviral drugs, whether they were whether they're actually acting via the NF-kappa B pathway, because if we knock out the gene and we find we can um, inhibit the effects of the antiretroviral drugs, and that will provide very strong genetic evidence um, for the role of NF-kappa B, because we previously we'd only done a very pharmacological type of, of experiment. Now, <clears throat> that's of cell biology. What about diagnosis? So the real the real uh, exciting thing now is that you can use this to uh, make diagnosis. And basically, what it, and it's been applied to Zika and Dengue virus to detect the Zika and Dengue viral uh, nucleic acid in, 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 in blood. And basically what it does is Cas9 is a, is a nuclease. It recognizes, so the Cas9, um, it has, it causes collateral damage. When it, when it eats up a, a piece of DNA, it chews up any other DNA that's close, in close proximity. And so this, basically the assay uses this property to measure and detect other, um, other types of DNA. So, and, and, and if, you, so if you imagine that this is a, um, a viral RNA, a Zika or, or Dengue virus um, RNA circulating plasma, you want to detect it, the Cas9 will come along and you put this guide RNA that will recognize it and then you have these, this adjacent RNA which has a fluorescent tag on it, and the fluorescent tag only fluoresces when, when that molecule is broken up. So you can use that to detect a specific um, uh, type of uh, nucleic acid in, in, in circulating blood. So that's a very exciting new technology that people have developed. Um, and they're suggesting it, it can be used in, 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 in uh, for example, in, in, in resource poor settings, so you can have urine, blood, or stool. Um, and then have um, uh, the system to detect whether it's either Zika virus infection or Dengue virus infection without actually um, uh, needing a, a, a laboratory to do that. So that's, this is another very exciting um, use of, of, of this technology. And I think we can look forward to more exciting developments in it. But I think the, for me the most um, exciting part was actually be able to use the CRISPR technology in, in certainly in our lab to, to do the kind of experiments and ask the kinds of questions that we were interested in. And I think also in the future, um, I did uh, actually suggest to uh, one of my scientists that we could try and develop a, a prenatal screening test um, for gender determination. So using maternal um, maternal serum, which, which has already been done, but we could use this technology to try and enhance uh, uh, and create a, 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 a very simple test. So that's something, again, that we can, we can uh, look forward to in the future. So uh, I've come to the end. So basically, to give you a summary, we've talked about antibodies and nanobodies and, and, and their advantages and how they can be used. Um, how they can be used for diagnosis, um, 
and then we covered uh, the next generation technology, which is which is gene editing, which is really exploding, and how it can be applied to both uh, diagnostic uh, laboratory medicine and also any uh, you know very simple uh, cell biology experiments that can be done uh, almost anywhere. Uh, thank you for your attention.